All right, so today we're going to talk about how to make badges. So you're probably wondering, who am I? My name is Cold Brew. I am a solutions architect at my day job, the founder and lead hacker at Rat, Rat 13 Labs, and I am the organizer of High Roller Con, or one of the organizers. Uh, if you see those little ducks everywhere for High Roller Con, those were us. I'm also a hardware hacker noob. And why do I say that? I say that because I am not an electrical engineer. I am not someone who's been doing this for 10 years. I'm just a dude who figured out how to do it by tinkering. And that means that all of you can do it too. This is not something that requires you to be some kind of crazy wizard. It's stuff that anybody can do if you just take the time and tinker with it. And that's kind of what a lot of this talk is about. Uh, if you'd like to follow me on things, this is kind of a list of all the social networks I'm on, basically in order of how often I'm on them. So if you're trying to hit me up on Discord, I may not respond for a week or two. All right, so what are we going to talk about during this talk? We're gonna, I'm going to try to go through as much of it as I can because we've got a live demo at the end and I really want to get to that. So first we're going to talk about how to come up with an idea. If you're going to make a badge, you've got to have an idea for it. The next thing is planning out the hardware, making sure that you know exactly how it's going to work and, you know, all of those kind of things. Planning out your firmware to make sure that the hardware can actually do the things you want it to do. Coming up with packaging and accessories if you want to include things like that with it. Uh, planning out the budget, making sure that you've got kind of all your T's crossed and all your I's dots. And then making the badge. So we're going to try and get through as much of this as we can. So a quick disclaimer before we dive into this too much. This is not like the right way to make a badge. There is no right way. Everyone has a different way they like to make badges. Every time I talk to a badge maker, I learn some new way to do it. This is just how I make them. I have a lot of people after DEF CON usually coming up and asking me about how I do it. This is how I do it. Okay, so the first thing is coming up with the idea. Uh, in a conversation with Alt Beer about a year ago, we were talking about badges, and he said the hardest part of making badges is coming up with a good idea. And this just stuck with me because this is so true. This is the hardest part. Once you know what you're going to build, the rest of the steps, they happen easily. You can just read documentation, you can figure things out, you can tinker. However you're going to do it, you can make the badge. But the idea, that's the part that you really have to work on and make sure it's something you're really going to be excited to build. So some things to think about when you're coming up with your design. How do you want it to look? Like what shape do you want it to be in? Do you want it to be abstract? Do you want it to look like a dog? You know, whatever you want it to be. And then once you know that, then you're gonna have to figure out, okay, the, the shape, the color, the size of it. Do you want it to be huge? Do you want it to be a little tiny thing? Maybe an SAO? Where's the lanyard gonna go? If it's a, you know, if it's gonna have a lanyard. Do you want to do the dual hook ones or do you want to do the single hooks? All of these things are gonna affect your design on this. The next thing is what do you want it to actually do? Or do you want it to do anything at all? Sometimes people just like the blinky, and that's fine too. Sometimes they want it to have really, really intense features. Whatever it is, you need to know what it's going to do before you start really diving into this. How are you going to power all this? You might need a big LiPo. You might be able to get away with a little 2032s. And the last thing is, what's your budget? you got to make sure that whatever you're trying to build is realistic for that budget. And think about the fact that you're not, or probably not at least, just going to be making one or two of these. You might be making hundreds of them. So these are all things to consider. And the last thing about that is be prepared to dump some money into this. It's not cheap. I'm not trying to scare you away from it or anything because it, you know, you can do it on a budget. But if you're trying to make something really intense and you might have to iterate a few times and usually places don't like to fulfill orders of just one badge. So you're probably making five at a time. And when it comes to your house and it doesn't work, all that money's down the drain. You got to figure out how it should work and then order another batch and hope that one works. So make sure that you're ready to actually put some money into this. Okay, so these are some of the badges that I've made in the past just to kind of give you some idea of things. I mean, some of these are, I try to get kind of a good range of like different sizes, different styles, different things, but it's something where you got to think about the, the coloring, the size, the shape, all of that. And these are some good examples of things that I've made. We can kind of get into them as we keep going, but just a few ideas. So now that you've got your idea, you've decided exactly what you're going to make. Now you can start to plan out that hardware. Is it just going to blink? If so, all you need is some LEDs and it, uh, the CH2032 is probably enough for you. Okay, those are the, the little coin cells that sometimes the DEFCON badges run off of. 
you got to think about your LEDs. They have those self-blinking LEDs. They're dead simple to use. I love using those in badges because it gives you some functionality. It gives you something that's blinking or flashing or whatever without having to use a microcontroller. Those usually also have a built-in resistor, so that's another part that you don't have to use. It makes your bomb tiny, it makes the amount of parts you have to acquire tiny. It just makes your life a lot easier, especially if you're trying to build something simple. Uh, SMD versus through-hole. SMD is surface mount devices. Those are the ones that, well, they mount on the surface. Through-hole is the ones that are actually going through the board. These can kind of change your design pretty wildly. For the little duck SAOs this year, we did the through-hole ones because we thought it'd be easier for people to solder on their own. But now when it comes time for us to solder 30,000 of these, you know, we just can't do it easily. So we end up only soldering a thousand of them ourselves. But a thousand ducks is a lot to solder. So we're kind of regretting that decision. But it's something to think about. If you're doing the SMD stuff, you can also do things like reverse mounting. So this badge here is a perfect example where we did reverse mount LEDs on the back of the board so that it shines through the board and kind of gives you that little effect you can see there with the blue and the red. And those were the self-blinking ones so we couldn't catch all four of them lit up at the same time. But you get the idea. You can do a lot with just LEDs and still make a really cool badge. Another thing I always tell people is that if you're making a very, very simple badge but you want to give it a little more flexibility or give it just a little something extra, consider an SAO port. Technically, the SAO, the SAO standard is supposed to have all six pins doing different things, but if you just put power and ground, that's all most SAOs use in the first place anyway. So it gives you a very easy way to add a little extra functionality for people to expand upon your badge. Okay, so if you do want to go with functionality, you want it to do something, you want it to have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, whatever it is, you got to think about how much processing power you're going to need for this. There's tons and tons of MCUs out there. I'm not going to talk about all of them. But the ones that I like to use for the larger power things where I need more processing power is something like the AT Mega 328P or the RPi 2040. These are really, I'm just giving these examples so you've got at least an idea in your head if you're starting to look into these things. Those are the ones that I have found are very easy to work with. They're very simple, they're beginner friendly, but they give you a lot of power. The next thing to think about is things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. A lot of badges these days have those things. Something like that, you're going to have to go for something like the ESP8266 or the ESP32 series. The 8266 is going to give you Wi-Fi, the 32 will usually give you Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Make sure you're checking the documentation though, because not all of them are going to give you those exact things. You've got to make sure you check the documentation. I have done this before where I ordered a chip thinking it had something, ordered the boards, got them in, soldered it all up. Turns out it doesn't work because I ordered the wrong chips. So learn from my mistakes and make sure you're reading the docs on these things. The last thing to think about is how many GPIO do you need? So on that one, if you're going to need a lot of GPIO, something like the AT Mega 32 or that CH32V003, that's the new Risk V chip, it gives you a ton of GPIO for like 10 cents a chip or something like that. They're super cheap, but they're pretty new, so they're a little bit harder to work with, which is another thing you want to consider when you're picking your MCU is how long has this been around? Is there a lot of documentation? Is there a lot of community support? Those are the big things you want to be looking at. Okay, so what is a GPIO? I know someone's going to be asking this. That is a general purpose input output. Those are the pins on the MCU. Those are the things that actually do something. So if you want to put a sensor or you want to blink an LED, anything that is an input or an output, you're going to need a GPIO for that. You can do some tricky things to get extra GPIO out of, out of your badges, but realistically, you want to have one GPIO per thing that you want it to do. Here's some quick examples of pins that have a lot of GPIO. Some of those are through hole, some of those are surface mount, but it at least gives you an idea of all those pins are different things you can do. For these keyboards here, you have to use one GPIO for each uh, row of keys and for each column of keys and that way you can pinpoint which key was clicked so obviously for the larger keyboards you're gonna need a lot more GPIO so it's just something to think about if you're building something that has a lot of functionality okay so you've got your idea you can plan out your hardware now now you can look at the power okay so do you, how long do you want it to run for 
my rule of thumb is usually if it's a if it's rechargeable, I want it to last at least 24 hours so that people can play with it at the con. They can go home at night when they're about to pass out and plug it in to recharge it and have it for the full next day. If it's not going to be a rechargeable battery, I want it to last the whole con. I want people to be able to leave it on, forget about it, fall asleep with it turned on, and still be running the next day. I mean, realistically, you could make things that power for months. I really doubt you need that, but it's an option. Um, when it comes to using power, the heavy hitters are usually things like NeoPixels and Wi-Fi. NeoPixels, there's a lot of tricks you can do to make them use a little bit less power. But if you really want that color cycling where you control what colors they are and how they move, it's going to cost you a bit of power. The last thing to think about is, do you need a charge circuit? And that's going to be if you're doing the LiPo batteries and you want to be able to recharge that. Some MCUs will have that built in. So again, you'll have to read the documentation and see, is this something that I need to build on my own? Or is this something that my MCU comes with? Now, I chose this badge for this slide because this is one of the spaces where I, I really screwed up and I really regretted it. So this is a lesson for y'all to learn from my mistake here is I used one of these, I think it was called a CH123 battery and they're not rechargeable. So you have to click it out and click a new one in every time you want to use it. I was using Wi-Fi and NeoPixels on this badge and it did not last a day. And once it died, where are you supposed to get one of these? So this was for Wild West Hackenfest. Those who have been to that, you know, there's not a lot of places to get batteries out there in the middle of Deadwood. So when these badges died, you were just kind of out of luck. So I included an extra battery with each one, but you know, it was an area where I regret that. So make sure if you're going to use a battery that can be swapped out, make sure you're using something that people can actually get their hands on when they want to get new, you know, replace that battery. Okay, so we're ready to build our thing, whatever it may be. So I usually skip this part. You should not skip this part. This is just me being lazy and not wanting to do it. But just for full disclosure, I usually end up skipping this. I do regret it later most of the time. This is going to save you a lot of headaches, and this is going to allow you to be able to send your circuit to other badge makers or other, you know, electrical engineers or whatever and say, hey, why is this not working? Or, hey, is this going to work? So we'll talk a little bit more about these later on, but you're going to want to draw it out. Okay. And this is something where it, you can see there, there's the AT Tiny 85 and it's going to some resistors and it's going to a USB port and it allows you to actually check out what your circuit's going to do and how it's going to do it to make sure all the connections are there, you know, and that it's going to work. So shameless plug, uh, a buddy of mine, Relay Moth, he actually sells t-shirts of, uh, of that circuit. So I've got one on right here. Uh, we have a few of them over at the Cyber Swamp Lords booth, but most of them have sold out. But you can get them online if that's something that you guys like. So once you have built out your circuit, now's when you're going to want to breadboard that. So you're going to build it with actual parts, but without a PCB. You're just jamming wires into a breadboard and connecting everything up to make sure that it works. Uh, you can kind of do little tricks like just touching wires together to simulate clicking a button. You can start to build out your firmware at this phase if it actually needs firmware, like if you're using an MCU and you want it to have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever. This is when you can start building that and make sure that the hardware that you're choosing can actually do the things you want it to do. Uh, also, I usually skip this step, too. Um, so don't listen to me. Just do what you're supposed to do. So that leads into planning out the firmware. Uh, usually Arduino IDE is a great place to start for this. They have ways to be able to test out all kinds of functionality on all kinds of different chipsets. They just make it a lot easier to develop on, especially if you're get, just getting started. Uh, what I always tell people is if you just Google the functionality that you want, chances are someone else has done something that's very close to that. Even if it's not super close to it, even if it's kind of a little bit off, you can usually just steal chunks of that and start mashing things together to build out the firmware you want. Those Fox badges that I built a few years ago, if anybody knows about those, they were really just a, a hop gobble of a bunch of other people's code that I was able to string together and make it work. You know, it's a simple way to start, especially if you're not great with writing firmware like me. It's a good way to get it going. 
So as long as you're using an MCU, some other ideas to think about adding in there is things like a CTF, things like feature flags, things like a debug mode, and again, the SAO. Things like that are a great way to add functionality onto your badge without really, you know, needing to change the hardware at all. So we had talked before about how SAO is a standard. This is the actual pinout for it. So you've got your three volt in your ground, then you've got a data and clock, and then you've got two GPIO. And that's just something where this is, if you want it to be a full SAO, this is what people are referring to. But again, you can just do that three volt in the ground and you're probably gonna be just fine. Also, some badge makers do not necessarily do 3.3 volt. I've seen badges that are sending six volt here. Maybe don't do that because that might blow up someone's SAO, but they, people do it, so. Okay, so packaging and accessories. This is an area where I always like to do a lot more. I know some badge makers, they just like to hand you a bag with a badge in it, and that's fine too. But I always think it's a lot more fun when badges come with like really cool packaging and they come with cool accessories. And it's this whole experience that you've built for someone rather than just handing them the badge. I always like doing that, so I always encourage others to do the same thing. If you're gonna do this, the thing to think about when you're doing it is, what do you actually need to use this badge? Like, if I handed you the badge, what would you need to just turn it on and use it right now? And then there's things like, what would you want to get with this badge? So the needs, I have things like USB cable, batteries, antenna, any of those kinds of things where it's like, to be able to use this badge straight out the gate, those are the kinds of things you would need. The things that are wants are things like the sticker or, a, you know, an extra SAO that comes with the badge or the, the case for it or whatever. Any of those things are things that it would be great to have that, but you don't really need it. Okay, so you've got all your ideas. You know what parts you're going to use. You know what accessories you're going to include and all that. Where the hell do you find it all? So I always tell people there's basically three tiers that you can go through to actually get this. There's your fast shipping kind of highest cost tier. And obviously that's Amazon. These are the kind of parts where you don't want to be buying your production parts off of Amazon. You're going to pay an arm and a leg. You're going to get them tomorrow, but you're going to pay an arm and a leg for it. But these are perfect if you get in a jam or when you're prototyping. When you're prototyping, you probably don't want to have to sit around waiting two weeks to get some parts just to try them out and be like, oh, that wasn't what I needed. Use Amazon, get them on there real quick because you're only buying one or two of them. The mid tier stuff is usually takes around a week of shipping. You can get them faster, but it's usually going to be sometime around a week. And these are things like DigiKey, Mauser, Arrow. Um, I know there's plenty more, but those are the ones that I've used and had good luck with. These ones are going to be very reliable parts uh, distributors, but they do take a little bit more time. You're going to get bulk pricing and things like that. And the more you buy, the more you're going to save on those ones. Those are usually where you want to go for things like MCUs, where it needs to be solid. It needs to work. It needs to be authentic. And the final one is the low cost, long ship times. And this is things like AliExpress. You can also use Timu or Alibaba or any of those as well. But any of these, you're going to have to wait for these parts but they're going to be dirt cheap, no matter how many you're buying. The one problem with this tier is that they're not necessarily authentic. I've had friends that have ordered a bunch of parts from AliExpress, they get them, and three quarters of them don't work, and they're obvious fakes. This is something where, to me, I like to order simple things that are like resistors or LEDs or things like that. I like to order those from AliExpress to get the better deal on them, but anything like an MCU where I need it to be good, I need it to work, and I need it to be authentic, I'll order that from that mid-tier. You can kind of choose to slice this however you want. That's just how I like to do it. Okay, so what is all this going to actually cost you? I've drawn out the way that I plan budgets, and these numbers are just made up, but this is how I like to do it, is I like to get all of my different things that I'm going to buy. So the PCBs, the components, batteries, lanyards, accessories, uh, cases, whatever, and put down how much the complete order of that thing is going to cost. Then how many units I'm going to make and the total cost to make it. So that is like if I had to invest, you know, in this case, $325 to prototype this out. You know, I ordered that many parts and boards and, you know, whatever to build this thing. Oh, whoops, sorry, that's time spent on dev. 
total cost to make would be all of those items totaled up, which gives me that cost per unit. From there, you can kind of estimate your shipping if you want to include that, put what price you're planning on charging, and have this calculate, like how much profit are you going to make off of these badges if you sell all of them? And also, what is your break-even point? How many of these badges do you have to sell to just offset the cost that you spent to make it? Um, let's see here. Yeah, so another thing is uh, kind of your, your prototyping and discovery costs, but also your equipment costs. Some people like to include that. I usually consider equipment that I bought to build a badge something that I would probably buy anyway for my hobby, so I don't usually include them, but it is something to think about. Okay, so we're finally about to get to the demo here soon, but uh, there's a couple things we want to go over before we do that. So I had mentioned we'd come back to designing the circuit. So this is the circuit that we're going to try to kind of get as far into as we can with building. So with this one, we're going to use the ESP-01S. This is kind of a very small ESP unit that gets us just a few I.O., but it gets us Wi-Fi, which is what we're going to do with this. It's easy to work with. It's very simple to solder, especially for first time solderers. Uh, so we're going to go with that one. We're going to go with a little one inch OLED screen so we can actually see what we're working with. We're going to go with the AAA batteries because they're simple. AAA batteries are going to give us 4.5 volts. All of this stuff we're using needs 3.3 volts. So we're going to have to use a linear regulator to cut that power down from 4.5 to that 3.3 that we need. Then we're going to include a little header so that we can actually program this thing and, you know, simple things like buttons, LED, and switch. Okay, so you're probably thinking, how do I know which of those GPIO I need to be using to do this? And the answer is simple. It's the documentation. Okay, so when you're looking through this documentation for your MCU or, or whatever it is that you're going to actually be using, they are very long documents. And especially if you're just getting started, they can be really, really overwhelming to look at. So even if you skip 99% of it, the things that you really need to look at is the pin definitions. This is going to show you what each pin does and what it, or I should say, what it can do. Because not every pin can do everything. So this shows you all the pins that your board offers or your MCU offers and then the list of things that it can do. But it also shows you what they call the active and the boot time for those pins. These are important because it's going to say high or low, and that tells you that it's going to be putting out power or not putting out power during the boot time or while it's turned on. So this is important because if it's supposed to be held high at boot time, but you have it cut off, that it's not going to boot. So make sure that you're paying attention to these things and understanding how they're going to work. The next thing you need to pay attention to in this is the typical application section. Usually it's going to show a more circuit diagram, kind of like that, that bottom left there, but it could also show just a picture of the unit itself. But what this is going to show you is what you need to provide to this chip just to make it work. You can add your own stuff after this to make it do whatever it is you need it to do, but these are the bare minimum of what you need to make this thing turn on. So you'll see in the uh, top one there, which is the ESP01, they've got a couple resistors there going from enable and reset to that 3.3 volt. But on the ESP01S, which is the one that we're going to use, they've eliminated those. They built those internally on the MCU, so you no longer need those. So for us, our minimal circuit is literally just that ground and the three volt, and then we need the RX and TX to be able to program it. That is all we need to make this thing work. Now, they also have a recommended circuit section sometimes. This is not always there, but in this particular one, they had that recommended circuit there of that power supply reference design. That's how we know that we're going to need that 3.3 volts if we're giving our badge significantly over that, which we are. So we essentially lifted out that one as well that we're going to use for this badge. Okay, so when you design a PCB, there's going to be tons of layers that it shows on here, and we'll, we'll show this once uh, we get to the demo, but the layers, some of them are additive and some of them are subtractive. And so this is kind of the hardest part to get used to when you start using something like Easy EDA, which is the one that I'm going to be showing you guys today. So there's the top and bottom layer, and this is the actual copper layer on your board. 
These are additive, which means that whatever I draw on my board on the top and bottom layers, they're going to put copper in that shape or in that design or connecting those things. Then there's the top silk and bottom silk layer. These are the silk screen. So if you have the traditional green PCB with the white writing on it, the silk screen is that white writing. And this one is additive as well. So anything that I write or draw or whatever, it's all going to show up in white or whatever my silk screen layer is. Then there's the top paste mask and bottom paste mask layers. These are what's known as the stencil layer. This is where if you were ordering a stencil for SMT, so you could just squeegee your, uh, your solder paste on there, this is the layer that they would cut out for that. So this is when you want to expose the copper or expose the PCB itself. These are subtractive. So anything that you draw on these layers, it's going to cut that off of the stencil layer. Top solder mask and bottom solder mask is very similar to this. This is the actual solder mask. So on the green and white PCB, this is the green part. Usually in Easy EDA, if you draw something on either the top paste mask or top solder mask, they're just going to cut it out anyway. So they effectively work the same way, but they are separate layers. So this one is also subtractive. It's going to cut out whatever you draw. Then there's a couple of different layers that are kind of more used for like the actual building of the PCB itself. So this is the board outline layer where that's actually the shape of your badge. And there's multi-layer, which is things like through-hole components or if you drill a hole in the badge or things like that. Then there's the rat lines. Rat lines is if you have all of your uh, pins set up in such a way where you have labeled the nets. So if you have a ground pin over here and a ground pin over here, but you didn't connect them, a rat line is where it's going to draw a big blue line across your screen saying, hey, these are supposed to be connected, but you haven't connected them yet. So that's just to help you. It's not going to be printed on the board or anything. It's just to help you design it. And that's same with the document layer. The document layer is there so that you can make labels for things that will not be printed onto the board. Now, a special note about that one, it's not supposed to be printed on the board. That doesn't mean that your fab will not screw up and accidentally print it on the board. So make sure before you click go on a massive order that they have not put the document layer on there because I've had some friends that it just happened to recently. Okay, so here's the demo time. We're going to see if this works. Everyone pray to the demo gods. We're going to try and crank through as much of this badge as possible. And, uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Okay, so I said earlier that the EDA, or the, the program that I like to use to build these is called Easy EDA. I usually use the online one, but just so I wouldn't have to worry about internet, uh, I've got the local one here. So, when you're first starting out, you're going to come in here and you're going to say you want a new project. We're going to call this Nibbler because we're going to build Nibbler from uh, Futurama. So the first thing it's going to give you is this to draw your circuit diagram. We've already done that, so we're just going to go ahead and skip past that. We're going to come over here and say that we want a new PCB. Now it's going to show you a lot of things here about, okay, how do you want this PCB to look? So it's going to tell us that we're doing millimeters. We're going to do two layers. This means there's copper on the top and on the bottom. You can actually do tons of layers if you want, and it's going to put those copper layers in the middle. This gets really, really expensive really quick. Most people that I know of just do the top and bottom layers. I know there is some badge makers out there that go crazy and do like eight layers and things. I stick with two. That's just me. So board outline, this is where you can pick if you want it to be a circle, round rectangle, whatever. I just start out by leaving this as rectangular. I'm going to tinker with it in just a bit, and you'll see how I do that, but I leave it as rectangular. And because of that, I leave these the same way, too. I'm going to mess around with that board on my own. I don't care what they make. Oops, I think I just clicked cancel on that. So we'll just leave these as defaults for now. So now we have our pink board outline here. Okay, so we're going to go to the document layer real quick. And we're going to click that we want to add an image. Now, on the desktop, I've got this Nibbler folder here where I've kind of picked out all of these. So we've got our document layer file that I've kind of preset to this. And there it shows us our little picture of Nibbler. So this is what our badge is going to look like. I'm going to set this to 150 because I've already tested this out, and that seems to be a pretty good size for us. So now we have our Nibbler, and we put it on here. So we want this board 
to match that nibbler. Now, again, there are lots of ways to do this in lots of different editors. This is just how I do it. I have been told this is the absolute caveman method, which it does kind of seem that way, but this is what I do. I just start dragging and dropping. I usually start out by making it pretty extreme like this, where it doesn't go very close. Whoops. But you can just drag these things and pull them all the way to where you want them to go. So I'm going to pull them all super gnarly right now, just so we can at least see it. But then once we get this kind of close to how we want it, then we can start getting it tighter and tighter, and we'll go over that too, but I'll just try and do this as quickly as I can. Now, one of these is not actually connected, and we're about to reach it right now. So this one here is the one to look at, because now I've opened it up. If I try and print this, JLCPCB is going to get real mad. So when we do this, we got to make sure that we connect these two properly and zoom in here to make sure they're actually touching. Okay, so let's say that's good enough. We're going to call it good enough for now. Once it is close, that's when I zoom in and start making this really close. So I've had people ask me, like, hey, how, uh, how good do you need to make this? The answer is as good as you want it to be. The tighter you make it and the closer you make it to exactly how your design looks, the better those angles are going to look when you print that PCB. So right there, you can see there's tons of little dots there. And it's really just how extreme do you want to take this? That's, that's really all it is. So let's say that we had that thing all done. We can come over here to view and click 3D view. And now it shows us there is our PCB. Right now, it's, they call it blue, apparently. We can make it green, we can make it purple, whatever we want. And we can select the surface finish here, too, if we want it to be gold or silver. But for now, this is our PCB. So let's come back here. And now we can say, okay, we want to add another layer. This time, we're going to add the top layer. So we come over here, and we go to copper. And these are all just files where I took a picture of Nibbler, and I put it into GIMP, and I colored in each layer with like say green or something like that selected everything that was green chopped out everything else and just saved just that one part okay so that's how i made these things once we have this i've already forgotten the name that i slayer the number so this one it says 62 and i'll show you how i got to that one as well is when i'm putting these in here i essentially just guess at first i say okay how about 60 and i put it over here and i say well that's that's a little bit too small now i can place it like that and I can readjust it over here and just say like, you know, okay, that's pretty close. Let's try 84 and just kind of adjust slowly that way. Or I can just delete that and re-enter it as a slightly different size. And this time I'll put in 62. And now it fits. So you really just kind of slowly adjust these things until they look the way you want. Okay, so now if I was to... I'm going to cancel out of this. Now if I'm to go over here and go to my 3D view, you can kind of vaguely see his little cape there because that is covered copper. We've added that copper layer, so now they're going to add copper in that spot on just the front. So on the back, there's nothing. But on the front, we can see that copper. So let's say we want to expose that copper. So let's come back here. We do another copper layer. Actually... Well, yeah, so you can do it like this and just make it match the same size. And now we're going to change this from the top layer to the top solder mask layer. Now it becomes subtractive. So if we put this on there and we go to our 3D view, now we've exposed that copper. So this is how you start designing out how you want that thing to look. Okay, so the next one we're going to do is we come in here and we go to our FR4 layer. This is the one where we're going to expose all of this as well. So it's still going to be that top silk. Oh, whoops, let me cancel this so I can actually go to the right thing. So we come over here and we change this to the top solder mask layer. We come back. We go back to that FR4 and this one says 94, so I'm going to set that. Okay, we're going to go ahead and put this right here. And now, when we view that again, there he goes. Now he's starting to look a little, little, little bit more like Nibbler. 
So the last one we're going to add is that top silk layer. So now once we add this, oh, I didn't look at the number, 142. And again, each one of these, I just found the numbers ahead of time because I didn't want to sit there adjusting in front of y'all and have it be really, really boring. But once we slap that in there, now we've got our nibbler. Now this document layer, we can come in here and we can turn that off. And this is what our badge looks like. And now when we go to that 3D view, let's make this black. And now we've got a vague shape of what nibbler is going to look like. Okay, so now that we have the art, and we're going to call that done, now we can start adding components. So we need that ESP01S. So we're going to come over here and say place footprint. And we can do ESP-01S. Now, once you do this, there's a user contributor sec or user contributed section. And these are things that other people have made and submitted their own footprints that they use. This isn't really that sketchy. I haven't had any of these that were bad yet, but they are all a little different. And some people do make some of these very, very custom where it's obvious that they were using this in some very unique way that is not how you want to use it. So just be careful to look at these and make sure it makes sense. The better one that I like to use is this one over here, JLC PCB Assembled because these are the ones that are actually from JLC. And this is where if you change your mind about soldering it yourself and you say, no, no, I want them to do it, you have to be using these footprints. So make sure that if you're going to have them populate this for you, th these are the ones you're using. Also, these tend to be a little higher quality in my opinion. So we're going to choose this one here and we're going to place it. So it shows it right here. So we're going to pop it down here. We're going to kind of zoom in a little bit. So once we grab this, we can kind of rotate it however we want. You can move it wherever you want. So let's let's put this right here so it kind of stays in these lines here and makes it look like it's part of our design. So now let's take this and let's put it on the back layer because we don't want this to be showing, which means I got to rearrange it again. Okay, so now if we go to our 3D view, we've got our nibbler just the way we saw him before. And you can see those little holes there. But when we turn them around, Oh, I guess this one doesn't do it. Some of them will actually show. There it is. So now we can see, okay, this is how it's going to look. There's our little part, exactly where it's going to be if we put it there. Okay, so now we're going to add 0.96 OLED. Just trying to make sure this is the right part before I actually place it. Yep, that, uh, no, we want the four pin version. There we go. Okay, so now this screen, we want this to be on the front side. Now, if I put it right here, you see it's on that red, that's the copper layer. So we're gonna be bridging those pins together. So we gotta be careful where we put this to make sure we're not touching any copper. So I'm gonna place that over here. We'll go ahead and rotate it a little bit. Nope. Oh. Don't want to do that. There we go. Let's put it right about there. Okay, so I can't remember for sure what these pins are, but let's say that this pin right here is a ground pin. So we come over here to net, and we can put that we want that to be part of ground. And let's say that this one right here is our 3.3 volt. So on this one, let's say that this one is ground. That next one is 3.3 volt. Okay, now if we turn on rat lines, you can see, hopefully you can see, there's those blue lines showing me, hey, you haven't connected these yet. So let's go ahead and go over how to connect those. So we're going to start on the back layer here because we've got this red copper here, so we can't go through that with a front layer. So we'll go from the back. And we're going to come over here. And this one right here, it says track. So we want to build a track, and it kind of snaps on here. We're going to build a track that comes up, comes over, and then comes down. Now we need one over here. So we're going to come like this, pull that over, 
and connect it like that. And now our rat lines are gone because now we've connected all ground nets to all other grounds and all of our three volt nets to all of the other ones. Now let's say that this right here was our, our data line. And this one here is our data line. And we still want to stay on the back there. But now when we go to connect this, we can't actually make it through here. Because if we do that, we're now connecting those two. They're going to become one net. So how do we get around that? Well, realistically, I should have just started from the front on this. But if we weren't going to go that route, we can stop this right here. We're going to stop it shy of where we're trying to go. And we can come over here to this one here. This one says via. And what this is, is this says, I want to build a little tiny hole that goes from the front of the board to the back of the board. So now I can go on the red and I can start at my via and move it over here and connect it like that. So these vias are how you can get around all of the other lines you've built or the design that you've built because now you're able to swap between that front layer and that back layer. All right, I'm trying to think if there was anything else that was major to be showing on this. But so, anyway, I guess actually, let's, let's look at this real quick. So there is now our badge as far as that goes. So let's say, okay, let's say this was done. We put on the rest of the components. We were happy with this. We like the way it looks. We like the way the functionality is looking. We want to we wanna print it. So we'd come over here and we would go to, well, first we have to save it. And then we come over here and say generate Gerber file. When you do this, it's going to ask you if you want to check the DRC. This is your design rule checking. These are the rules where they tell you how close you can put things to each other and how large you can drill or how small you can drill, but also things like, are you crossing nets? It's going to check for all of that kind of stuff. So you can say, yes, you want to do it. And in our case, we passed. All of our nets are not bridging and nothing like that. But when you get to that step, there is sometimes when that design rule checking is going to show you something and say, hey, this is wrong. You can't do this. But you know that it's what you're trying to do and you don't care. You can just click that no and just say, YOLO, I want to order it anyway. And they'll let you. So from here, you can select how many you want and what color you want. But really, that's going to be more. Uh, it's going to show you that once you get into JLC. Now, again, you can order these from anywhere you want. I like using JLC PCB. I've always had good luck with them. They do great work. It's, they have good prices and they can do the fab for you if you want them to. But you can send them off to anywhere by clicking this generate Gerber button. This one right here is just going to download the files for you and ask you where you want to put them. And now you can send those out to someone else. You can share them with friends. You can send them to any fab shop and they'll be able to build those boards for you. Okay, so let's say we had clicked to have JLC do that for us. Let's come back here. We'll go ahead and click go. So this is what it's going to show you in JLC PCB. It also shows you a, a little picture of your board up there at the top, but this is what you're going to see. There's a lot to go over on here, but the big ones to look at is checking the dimensions to make sure it looks like what you built. Sometimes those can be wildly off, especially if you didn't connect those two board outlines together. PCB quantity, obviously, you're going to want to look at that. Um, the next big ones to look at is down a little bit further there where it says PCB thickness and PCB color. So the thickness is literally just how thick the board is. If you leave that at 1.6, that's your standard badge. That's pretty much what everybody uses. You're really only going to want to adjust that if you're trying to do something special with the PCB where it needs to be significantly thinner or significantly thicker for whatever reason. But it is going to adjust the cost pretty heavily if you change that. PCB color, obviously that, that's the color of your actual badge itself that you're creating. And then silk screen on JLC, they don't usually have any other option other than white unless you're printing a white PCB, in which case your only option is black. More than likely, you won't need to adjust that because you can't. The next one under that is surface finish. This is what's going to determine the color of that copper layer. If you want to do a black and gold badge, then you need to do that ENIG. That is uh, immersion gold. I can't remember what ENIG actually stands for. But um, if you want the silver, that's where you're going to go with either the hassle or the lead free hassle. Either one of those two is going to be that silver color that you see on PCBs. 
Now, the last one that you need to make sure you look at is that remove order number. This one, I don't know why they do not click yes by default, but they do not. The default is no. They're going to print your PCB number directly on it. And the reason for this is that they want you to be able to reorder that exact batch. So later on when they say, you know, would you like to reprint, you know, your previous batch, you can look at the badge and you can say, okay, this is the batch number from the one that I made. Yes, I want that exact one. Realistically, you don't want that, especially because they're going to put it in the worst possible spot. They're going to put it dead center front and center of your badge. Just check that box. It does add, like, I think it's $1.50 to remove the order number from your badge. It's, it's worth it. Just do that one. So that's all I've got for you, but go out there and make some badges. Seriously, it's not that hard. It's a lot of fun. We wouldn't keep doing this year after year after year if it wasn't. So anyway, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions whatsoever after this. Feel free to come chat with me in the vendor booth. I love meeting new people. Do not hesitate to ask. Hope you guys all have a good DEF CON.